this computer. All right, so I've got the Zoom meeting started and it's almost <laughs> just about the right time to start the class. Isn't that great? Um, I see there's 18 of you guys out there, 17 of you guys out there, and I know there's about 28 students. So there's still a couple of people, either they're gonna attend or we're gonna have more people show up or um, they'll watch online later on, which I, like I said, I have been recording and I have posted both um, the first and second lecture on YouTube with a YouTube channel. So that should be there. Um, while making breakfast this morning, I was scrambling some eggs thinking, there's something I forgot last week and I realized, oh my goodness, I forgot to post the assignment. And I, and I promised you guys two assignments. So, I got one up this morning just before class and we'll, we'll kind of go over what's in it. Um, the second assignment, hopefully I'll get done today and I'll post that pretty soon too. Um, today in class, Paul, you're here. I saw your name up. Um, you're gonna be one of the people I call on for questions, Brooklyn. Are you in class? Oh, yeah, I see you there. Okay. Israel, I've got you down for answering questions. Israel's in class. Thanks. So um, next, Robert. Robert, are you in line? Robert's there. Okay. Case. Uh, case. Mr. Um, case Lyle. Mr. or Miss? That's me. Yeah. It's, it's Mr. Dude. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're on, um, one of the people I'm calling on for questions. And I think Shuba. Hey, Shuba, are you online? Let me look. Yep, you're on. Okay, so I've got all six of you guys online. Great. Um, so like I usually start off with uh, questions in class. Let me share my screen with you guys so you can see what's the, what PowerPoint I have for you. Um, it's Control Shift S. And it's PowerPoint. So I'll share my PowerPoint with you. Put that up. Oops, I'm way in the middle. Yeah. Go back to the beginning. Here we go. All right. So I'm just starting the lecture right now. You're joining us, um, haven't missed much. It's, it's just starting. I got a question for you guys. Now, in the YouTube video, you can see my video of me presenting as well as um, the PowerPoint lecture that I'm sh when I'm sharing a screen, can you see the chat as well at the same time? I don't know. Um, I don't recall if it's there or not. Yes, you can. You can see it. Yeah. It, is it because of the closed captions or is it part of the whole Zoom video? You can just toggle the chat and the participant windows on or off. I see. Okay. Was that Case? No, it was Paul. Paul. Oh, thanks, Paul. We haven't met yet. <laughs> in person but uh so on that note are we um going to in-person classes or are we remaining on line for the lecture that's a good question and from an email i got yesterday or this morning i'm not exactly sure what time 
it looks like this is my final online lecture and that next week we'll be in class. Is that the message that you guys got as well? Or have you heard that yet? Not specifically for microbiology, but for chemistry, we'll be moving to in class next week. I think it's for microbiology as well. I saw a PDF and uh, the class schedule had a bunch of classes during your week of when classes are scheduled and ones that were going to be on site have a little check mark. And I, I believe that's, it means that we're going to be on site. Okay. I guess you'll send us a note once you've confirmed that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but to me right now, it looks like that, yes, we're going to be on site next week. And let me write that down. Send out confirmation. Um, there was also this question about where to store stuff on campus. Uh, the question about lockers and you can rent out a locker for the semester. I think it's $15 for the semester. And um, if you want, you can rent out a locker and share a locker with someone you trust if you want to do that. Um, there are lots of lockers close to our lab. So hopefully you get one within the A-wing area or I-wing area. Okay, so uh, let me just carry on with the lecture. So today's lecture is the food and micro, uh, microscopy and food bacteria lecture. Um, now the assignment that I posted, the due date is gonna be two weeks from now. And the reason is because um, I'm gonna cover food bacteria this week. And next week I'm gonna cover some eukaryotic food microbes. And so next week you'll have more uh, idea of what to look for. And it's a typed out assignment. It's kind of like a formal report and it's kind of long. So I give you more time to do it. All right. So here's a review of last week's lecture or this week's lecture. Um, I'm going to cover microscopy, history, history of microscopy, and some basic microscope information. Tomorrow's lab is an introduction to the microscope. And so you'll get to actually see uh, and use a microscope for our first lab. This um, I think the lab is to take prepared slides and look at them under the microscope and draw pictures of what you see under the microscope. Um, the other thing that I have in lecture today is some food bacteria and I give you two categories of bacteria which are gram positive and gram negative bacteria. We clump most bacteria into these two categories. And we'll talk a little bit about that at the end of class. Okay, so carrying on, um, click. Some notes about the lab. Remember, you need a blue microbiology lab coat. There may be one or two extra ones um, that are available for you, but don't if you don't have one yet, um, let, let me know first thing. You also need the no carbon required book as well as uh, the information that both lab manual and the lab coat are going to be discarded at the end of the semester. For the semester, there's two kinds of lab reports. One is 
an informal lab report where you come to the lab and um, you look in the lab manual and write down all of the answers as the lab manual asks you to. And then at the end of the lab, you hand it in. Um, actually, that's not great. What you do is you take the non-carbon paper, take it home, take a picture of it, and you send that to me, okay? That way um, the paper is in your possession. There's one section I kind of stress, and that's the materials and methods section. It's a simple, quick sort of um, procedure for this lab that I don't want you to write very much out for materials and methods. I want you to write out a full comprehensive sentence. And the sentence reads like, um, for lab one, which is the safety and microscopy lab, use the materials and methods found in, and then you'll take a title of the lab manual. Hold on a second. I thought I had my lab manuals with me. I left them in the car. That's right. Let's get this mixed up. Sorry, um, I was just gonna show you a copy of the lab manual, but it's not with me. It's in the other, it's uh, in my car yet. <laughs> I picked them up on Friday. Um, so the title of the lab manual is there and the authors are Joyce Myers and myself, and you're also to include the date, and the date would be 2022. So I just need a sentence when you're writing out materials and methods for lab, but I need a sentence there as part of the materials and methods. Also, if there's exceptions to the lab procedure, um, sometimes I don't have an organism, or I say there's a different vessel to be used or a different piece of equipment to be used than what's in the lab procedure. So I tell you to include that in the lab under materials and methods as well. Later on in the semester, after reading week, we have formal lab reports and those are typed. Um, with the formal lab report, you take your yellow pages home with you and you type out the lab report you share the yellow pages as well as the formal lab report. And the formal report is based on a template. I've got the template for you already. And what I'll do is post that online. Um, with the lab assignments, I will post a section where you can just submit the lab online. Um, everything for the course will be through um, the main DC Connect page. I know there's a DC Connect page for the lab and a DC Connect page for the course. I'm just gonna do everything through the course site. Um, the use of multiple pa pages like that are for labs, courses that have lots of lab sections and they're um, for the instructor to kind of keep track of the students. But in this case, I can keep track of everybody. I'm the only instructor, I'm the only one running a lab. So it's easy enough for me just to have everything in one place. Okay, so like I showed you guys last week, if you recall, when you come to main campus, there's this um, area that's the Oops, oh, I'm drawing. I meant to just kind of highlight. Ah, here he is. So uh, this is the bus route area. And at the end of the bus route area is the circle. Um, it's the DC Connect circle. 
it looks like a Stargate to me. And on the right hand side here is the entrance way to the I wing. And this is also the an entrance or a quick shortcut to the bookstore. So here's what it looks like. The I wing um, has three doors. You just go through the door. There's automatic entrance. You can press the bar to get inside. Will the bookstore be open tomorrow morning? I believe it opens at eight. Um, uh, good point, Sebastian writes that writing utensils should stay in the lab as well. So bring a pencil or pen that, no, bring a pen, no pencils. Uh, bring a pen that you can give up for the lab this semester. So we'll give you a Tupperware container and inside of the Tupperware container, that's where you can store your lab coat, your lab manual and your writing implement as well as a inoculating loop. So there'll be just three or four things that you keep in your own little named bin. Um, there'll be a guard at the door when, and you'll see the guy um, and you'll be able to just log in like you would in Whitby and show him your DC Connect Pass. Uh, the lab manual is, um, that there's the instructions. I have the instructions and the non-carbon paper lab manuals, those are in the bookstore. If you're in a jam, you didn't get one tomorrow morning. I have a couple in the lab they, from previous years. Um, if you're willing to go ahead and use that, that it might be there for you. Okay, that was Paul. Is that okay? And Matthew says, I don't have a lab coat yet. There might be a few still in the lab that were from last year. Um, goggles, goggles will be provided to you and those will stay in your kit. Um, we'll, I'll be handing those out first thing tomorrow. Okay. Uh, and where is the lab located? If you look, this person is walking towards the stairs on the left-hand side. It's just up the stairs and down the hallway, uh, turn left and you'll eventually come to A206. I think there's one bank of lockers you pass in order to get to the, or maybe it's two banks, one bank, two. There's some lockers you pass the lockers and you'll get to the lab. Yeah, I think it's two. <laughs> okay, here's a review of lecture two. This is from last week. Um, we covered archaea, bacteria, as well as some structural differences between the two. And then we talked a little bit about bacteria um, and this, what makes up bacteria. I talked about eukaryotes, um, what makes up eukaryotes and how are these two organisms different and I also briefly introduced staining microscopy and dilutions. So that's what we covered in class last week. Here's a uh, first question. Oh, I've annotated the slide here. Accidentally, sorry. <laughs> okay. What makes um, the membrane of archaea slightly different from bacteria and eukaryotes? Just one of the six people, any one of you guys. Paul, Brooklyn, Israel, Robert, Case, Shuba. Paul's got the answer there. There's ether lipids, um, correct. Let me just give you a drawing of what that kind of looks like. So a lipid is represented in chemistry as kind of like a long carbon chain 
where it's got three carbons. Oh, that vanishes. <laughs> draw, draw. We're going to draw here. Okay, so. So this would be like the hydrocarbon or the fatty part of the molecule. And then the ether portion is at the end of the chain. So that's what I mean when I say the uh, lipid is based on ether. Um, in bacteria, the end of the chain, this is uh, your archaea. Let me just type that out. For bacteria, it's not an ether, it's more of a phosphate. Phosphate. And that turns out to be important for um, the distinction between gram positive and gram negative bacteria later on. What kind of things are at the end of the fatty acid chain? And how many fatty acid chains are there? Okay, so thanks, Paul. That's the first question. Uh, second question How are archaea different than eukaryotes? And Israel says, archaea have no nucleus. Correct. Yes, thank you. So that's uh, exactly what I'm looking for is that archaea don't have an organized nucleus that is common to all our, uh, eukaryotes. Um, th there's another difference. They can use different energy sources. Yeah, there's a couple of differences, like I should say. <laughs> um, and that's a really good one because archaea can be extremophiles and they can use uh, sulfuric acid, light energy. Uh, they can use all kinds of different sources. Um, and ammonia, yes, they can use ammonia to for energy. Reproduce versus binary via binary fission. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also um, remember we're talking microbes. So eukaryotes are big, and so archaea are very small in comparison. They can be ten to hundred times smaller than your other microbes. Okay, oh, I gotta erase all of this now that I've drawn it. Okay, and I mentioned the word extremophiles. What are extremophiles? And can you name me two uh, extreme environments? Robert's got intense heat, like in the thermal wells in the bottom of the ocean. That's, yeah, absolutely. Matthew's got um, extreme cold, and that's correct. Uh, we can find them in ice lakes underneath glaciers. And Shiva says the hot springs. This is like the hot springs in Wyoming or Iceland. Yep, that's correct, all correct. 
And uh, Brooklyn's even got uh, the halophiles. That's right. The salt lakes of Saskatchewan or Utah um, are environments that have these extremophiles. Thanks. What are, why are eukaryotes larger than prokaryotes? And Paul's got the answer is cell structure is way more complicated and there's more environments in the cell. Yes, that's right, true. Uh, you'll recall the um, Golgi apparatus or the mitochondria and the nucleus inside of uh, the eukaryotic cells. They're actually what are referred to as organelles. So it's like um, a small region within the cell that has a very specific job and it's way more complicated than what goes on inside of the bacteria. It's like the same process, but at a bigger level. And um, the bigger level makes it a bigger cell. Okay, and here's a bunch of questions. Um, why would you use a stain for microscopy? Yeah, Brooklyn, that's correct, yep. It's a uh, very complicated metabolic reactions undergone inside of the uh, eukaryotic cell, for example, inside of the mitochondria. Anyway, um, question, why would you use a stain for microscopy? And Paul's got the answer. Yeah, so if you put liquid that has bacteria or eukaryotes in it, and you put the liquid onto a slide, um, and you look at that and intense magnification, you might not be able to see the living material there because the liquid might be the same color as the um, cell surface of these organisms, the cell, cells have a lot of liquid inside of them as well. So just magnifying it isn't enough. You have to kind of give it some color. So what you do is you add a staining agent and a popular staining agent could be iodine or it could be um, crystal violet. Crystal violet is a blue, intensely blue dye that they use in the lab. Um, safranin is a red-based dye. There's lots of different colors that are added to microbes. And you can actually make out the outer membrane of these things if you add these dyes to the uh, slide. So that's why you would use a stain. Thanks, Paul. And Brooklyn's got uh, spiral and rod shapes. Um, that's not the correct answer as to why you'd use stain, but that's what you would see if you used a stain for microscopy of my, um, bacteria. You may see spiral or rod shapes. Okay, and question number six, how do you know if you properly put microbes on a slide? And let me just kind of describe the details of how you do this. You take your microbes off of a plate with a, um, it's like a, little inoculating loop. You can kind of pick them off of a Petri dish or out of a broth and put them onto a slide and it's kind of like a liquidy layer. And then what you would do is let that dry and then you'd put it over a flame and then you would stain it. That's kind of the typical procedure. And then you examine it. How would you know if you've done those steps properly? Oh, you've already answered number eight. Thanks, Brooklyn. <laughs> okay. She says those are the two common shapes of bacteria. And that's true. It's kind of a tricky question 
maybe I haven't talked about this yet. Um, you should be able to see the bacteria clearly on the side. Amanda, that's a good guess. Yes, you should be able to see them there, but there's more than that. Um, cells will have the same color as the stain. Yes, that's true too. One more detail, and that is the cells are not moving. Now, I said to you, what you do is you put the uh, microbes onto a slide, you put it over a flame, and then what the flame does is it releases all the uh, moisture from within the cell. So you, you've dried the cell and then you've heated this uh, microscope slide. And what that does is it kind of bakes the bacteria onto the glass. And so because of that uh, small quick baking step, the bacteria are dead and they're set so they don't move anymore. So if you take a microscope slide and you have uh, yeast or bacteria on it, and you look at it under the microscope and they're moving all over the place, then it's not a properly per, uh, made slide because the microbes are moving. So you know they're still, they could still be alive. Um, so if they're not moving and they're absolutely still, then you've known you've properly made the slide. So it has to be stained and they have to be not moving. So there's kind of like two things there. Thanks guys. Um, next question, what are some common sizes of a microbial colony? And this can be, it varies. So it can be really tiny and really large, but what's a common size? Oh, can I repeat the first one before not moving? Um, so, you know, you've properly made a slide if the slide is, or if the microbe has stain and it's colored, but also, which you guys were saying, they've absorbed the color, it's also not moving. So it has to be fixed and dead on the slide. Yeah, no problem. Um, Amanda says nanometers, and that's the size of the structures with maybe a really super powerful microscope. You don't typically see nanometers. I'm talking about the colony. So a colony is if you take one microbe and that microbe divides and divides and divides and divides until there's like, a billion microbes or maybe a hundred million microbes. And you can actually see them onto a Petri dish. If you see them in a Petri dish, there's hundreds of million in a small little area. And Paul's got the answer. What, it's about anywhere from a millimeter to a centimeter. So it can, be, it can be a range. It can be as small as a millimeter. It can be as big as a centimeter. Um, it can be bigger, two centimeters. It depends on the organism. Uh, if it's yeast or if it's uh, fung fungus or um, mildew, then it can actually be the entire size of the plate. So a plate is approximately 10 centimeters across. So a microbial colony can be as large as 10 centimeters. Now you've seen bread mold. The spots on bread mold, those are microbial colonies. So they can be anywhere from two to five centimeters in size if your bread is really moldy on the surface or as small as one tiny little dot, like Paul says, one millimeter. So yeah, you got, thanks. So let's carry on. So this is, that's the review for lecture two. And uh, let me just kind of point out lecture, um, in lecture I've got the, little information here about um, assignment one. And like I said, assignment one's due in February. And it's beneficial microbes. I'm gonna ask you to investigate, and the, here's the first part of it. 
uh, identify a food that relies on bacteria. And if you think of a food that relies on bacteria, it could be any kind of cheese product, uh, any kind of uh, yogurt, any kind of um, maybe you've done some investigating and you, you found a food that's interesting and it needs a bacteria to be made, then you could put that down. So um, I would also like you to do a little bit of online research and try and find a brand. So uh, I'm trying to think of a brand of cheese. So let's say the food is Roquefort cheese. So Roque, how do you spell Roquefort? Or Roquefort cheese. And what's the brand name? Um, maybe there's, I should have just went to the fridge and looked. <laughs> I could grab a brie, but I don't know what the organism is in the brie. Um, and what is the scientific name? And you'll have to look this up. Rook for TI, and there's something there. Um, Brooklyn's got Activia, yeah. Uh, there's Activia yogurt and the Activia yogurt has microbes in it. Um, Streptococcus lacticus is a very popular uh, organism. Roquefort can be uh, made with Streptococcus lacticus, but um, there is a Rogue 40 I cheese and you'd have to look at the brand because they might use a different kind of organism to make their stuff. So just include a brand, include the organism that makes the uh, stuff. And how do you find this out? It, just do a web search for these things and then describe the process of manufacturing the food. So if I said Rogue for trees, I could have might've spelt it wrong there. Um, I would explain how the cheese is made. So this is, that's the assignment. That's kind of like how to get started on the assignment. Um, there will be another assignment. Um, get rid of my rook for cheese and whatnot. I'm going to give you a metric conversion size numbers. Uh, assignment and that'll be coming up as well. Okay, so that's uh, review and the assignments. Um, here's a overview slide of what we're doing today. So that was the review info. Next, it's the microscope history. And here's a picture of a microscope. You'll see there's two ocular lenses and um, down at the bottom are the objective lenses that you would look at uh, your specimen under. Um, this microscope is a specially set up for viewing with the computer. So they also have another third eye tube that is attached to a camera and the camera is attached to the computer. So the person, whoever is using it could look at whatever they're looking at by eye on the computer. Um, they have an orange shield at the bottom. The orange shield is there because the light that is used on this microscope in particular is fluorescence light. So they can use a fluorescence bulb and uh, illuminate your sample with the fluorescence light. But the fluorescence light is so bright, it's hard on the eyes. So that's why there's an extra little shield there to protect you from the fluorescent light. So what is the history of microscopy? Um, well, 
one of the very first people to make observations using a microscope was a man by the name of Robert Hooke. Um, a lot of the scientific people uh, who make discoveries are men. The history of science is very male centric. <laughs> Obviously, uh, this is what we have for the last 300 years. Um, Robert Hooke was also a philosopher. And what he did was he had a very rudimentary microscope set up. And he took a slice of cork, put that underneath a microscope. And he noticed that the little shapes were like little squares. And so he came up with the word cells to describe what he was seeing under the microscope. And he called these cell, uh, so we now have the word cells from Robert Hooke. Um, the magnification of his microscope was approximately 20 times larger than by eye. So it was a, like I said, rudimentary handheld sort of device. And you could see about 20 times larger than life. Oh, here it is. I've included a picture of the first microscope. So this is a little barrel. It's got an eyepiece and the eyepiece probably has a glass lens and it has another lens at the bottom. You put the sample in the stand here to take a look at your cork. The next person who gave us information on um, microscopy was a haberdasher <laughs> or a draper. He had a fabric store. He was a self, uh, self-employed businessman. And he took it upon himself to inspect his material, the cloth material that he would sell people. And what he would do is he had this device and you can see the device on the left-hand side um, of this slide. It's like a rectangle with a little point. And what you do is you put your fabric in this point area and hold it right up to your eyeball through a bright light. So you could look through the um, window, like you just kind of look up at the sky and with this against your eye and you'd see the interweaving of the fabric. And that would tell him how uh, well constructed the fabric was that he was buying. So he inspected his fabric and he was really particular about that. And that's why he learned how to use this microscope. And then he decided that what he'd do is look at um, smaller things. And he taught himself how to make a microscope and he ground and polished these lenses, um, which is kind of an art in itself. You take a little piece of glass and you have different kinds of dirt in different piles. So you have like a 10X grit with medium-sized particles, 100X grit with tinier particles, 1000X grit with the even tinier particles. You have to keep these piles apart because you want to polish your glass differently. So um, he could magnify up to 250 times and he could see things like blood, semen, yeast, and pond life. He was the first person to scrape his teeth and look what was in his, uh, on his teeth. And he proclaimed that everything, he, or everywhere he looked, there was life. And to us, he's the first person to describe bacteria. So the name of this fellow again, Anton von Leeuwenhoek. And he gave us the observation that um, there was life almost teeming everywhere. But he had a problem when he was doing this. He had to convince people that there was life in pond water or um, on skin or on your teeth or in your blood. 
he had to convince religious leaders and politicians in order for him to like share this information. So he would have to show religious leaders and politicians his findings. Like he couldn't just write this out and write to a friend in another country. He actually had to go through a very detailed kind of manner of convincing lots of people before he could share the information. It's because at the time they had no explanation for things like diseases. They thought it was bad air or uh, a, the touch of the devil or just other ex reasons. Um, the person was living a bad life, he's gonna get diseased. They didn't have a microscopic explanation for things. So um, they used their superstitions and what he was observing explained superstitions. Robert K asked who was put into a mental institute for talking about bacteria. Um, so many, <laughs> I'm not too sure what the story is you're thinking of, but I, I believe the story. If there's a little bit more information, I might be able to come up with something. Let me write that down. I know a microscope. Uh, I know a bacteria expert I could ask. Who is a doctor? I'll need a little bit more detail, and I'm sure I could find out Samelweiss. Maybe, I'm not familiar with the story of this person. Do you, do you happen to remember more of the story? Ah, you even got a link there. Thanks, Paul. We could look at that. I could post that on the uh, class website later. Thanks. Okay. Um, in the 1700s, we have some more innovations and improvements to microscope. And scientists, uh, there was no formal job scientist. There was like business people, rich people, nobility. And uh, some of them would kind of putter off at home and do their own experiments. Um, scientists, the scientific uh, experimentation started becoming popular thing to do amongst doctors and the community in universities where people would learn things. And so this is where a lot of our scientific development occurred at universities and among doctors. Um, and doctors and scientists realized that there's a lot of things going on with these microbes. Um, in the 1800s, there's a special name, a doctor named Joseph Lister reduced something called spherical aberration. Now, this is a light effect. What happens is if you put two lenses together, um, normally, Uh, 
I say normally, you can put them together in, like, in a way that when you look at the image through the lenses, the lenses all just, or the uh, image is distorted, the colors don't match up, and it looks kind of fuzzy and weird. This is a chromatic aberration. So you can see here, there's two lenses against each other. And what's going on is because they're different, there's a difference in light traveling through them. So what Lister figured out is that if you use two different kinds of lenses, uh, convex and a concave lens, um, and set them together, what happens is you can fix the aberration. And what happens in that case, you get one nice spot, a sweet spot where the lenses are perfectly in focus with their, uh, due to the speed of light through the solid um, where, where things match up. Okay, so that, I'm just going back and forth. Um, that's the idea of a compound microscope. And you need that in order for us to have a compound microscope. So questions, questions. Uh, who is the first person to observe bacteria under a microscope? This is a common microbiology question. What was this person's name? He's the Dutch haberdasher had fine clothing, fine fabrics. Leave and hook. Yep, that's correct. Amanda Scott. Amanda and Natalie, they both have uh, the correct answer. Next question. What was the contribution of, that's okay, uh, Joseph Lister that he made to modern microscopy? Lindsay says, this is the person responsible for the compound microscope and she's correct. Um, Joseph Lister's son. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, the in, uh, invention of the putting the two lenses together reduces an effect called chromatic aberration. Um, Joseph Lister's son, who also became a doctor, gave us a uh, development in medicine, um, and we use Listerine, and Listerine is eventually uh, comes to us <laughs> from Joseph Lister's son, who is a doctor, who is one of the first person people to wash their hands before surgery, which never happened before that. <laughs> okay, so that's the historic questions. Then I've got a lot of information about microscopy, microscopy principles. Before I do the microscope questions, um, the microscope principles go over what the parts of the microscope are the objective lenses down here, the ocular lenses, the difference in coarse focus versus fine focus, that sort of thing. Okay, so microscopy uses the microscope to look things that we can't see through uh, as a, with a naked eye. We might be able to see the things we just want to see it bigger. Um, there's stereo microscopes used in soil microscopes biology. Uh, you can use those to kind of scan through the dirt, but these are at uh, typically a 10x zoom. So the microscopes that we have in lab um, 
go a hundred times more than that. There's a couple of branches of microscopy, uh, including optical microscopy. Optical microscopy uses light as the source that uh, we're imaging. There is a branch of microscopy known as electron microscopy. What happens is you have a detector and uh, the detector detects electrons bombarding a sample. And you can visualize the electrons like you would from a television tube. The television tube um, captures the movement of electrons and scans the electrons detected across your screen. So what we're looking at is movement of electrons on our cathode ray tube. Uh, LED screens don't work the same way, do they? I don't think so. I don't know. And this is just something that's popped into my head. Sorry, <laughs> just pay attention. Uh, next we have a microscope called a scanning probe microscope. There's more, I'll go over the other ones as well. There's atomic force microscope and um, tunneling microscope. Anyway, the principles of microscopy are, um, you have electromagnetic radiation moving Electromagnetic radiation can be radio waves, light waves, electron waves, X-rays. And these uh, electromagnetic waves could be light. They all travel through objects and things happen when the light or energy travels through. It can diffract, it can reflect. And that interaction is picked up by the lens or a detector. And that signal is uh, amplified so we can actually make a sense of what that signal is. Um, it says down below here, you can have irradiation of the sample, like light microscopy is called irradiation because it's light. Um, there's also fine beam over a sample. So that's where you have the electrons moving back and forth over a sample. And those electrons that move back and forth get picked up by a detector. So what are some of the words you need to, oh, what well, kind of useful to know? Um, there's something called a wavefront. And if you think of a wavefront, waves move like an, off of water and the front wave may have, is called a, a front. Um, but if you can also think of that as a bunch of points all moving at the same time. And light is a number of points moving at the same time. And so you have a wave front, there's also reflection. So your wave front hits a surface. And if it bounces, where the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection, it reflects off into another direction. Um, that happens at an interface between two different media. Um, the word locus set of points where location satisfies more conditions. I think the locus is um, used when you're talking about the wave front gathering together in one point. There's also another important term and that is refraction. Refraction is what occurs when light or electromagnetic radiation travels through an object, could be glass, could be water, and because it's a different media, the light 
moves at a different speed. And because it's moving at a different speed, it bends. So if you can see here, uh, here's the picture. Here's an incident ray. Here's the angle of incidence against the normal where it bounces uh, from the air into the glass. And then the angle of incidence that comes through in the glass makes forces it to bend. It's forced to bend because the glass is more dense than the air. And then it comes through again, oops, at a different location. So it doesn't go straight perfectly through. It goes, it bends at, a look, at an angle. And this is why when you're looking in the water and you try and reach into a pond, you might not actually grab the rock or fish that you see in the water, but just kind of miss because the angle of incidence uh, is, the, the image is kind of off of where the object is off of where the image is. And so you have to move to where the image actually is. <laughs> okay, um, on the left-hand side of this is a picture of two glasses and the two glasses have two straws. Notice the two straws are going into the liquid at the exact same angle. Why do the bottoms of the straws look different? My question for everybody, what do you think guys? Ladies, men, folks, people. Lindsay says, the two liquids are different. They're different mediums, yeah. So one is a denser liquid. Maybe it's an oil. They might both be clear, but obviously they're not the same density. So light is bending at a different speed through these two liquids. So that's why they have different looks to them. Good job. All right, here uh, I took a couple of pictures in the lab one day of things I was doing. Um, I just wanted to show you the eyepiece. All of the lab microscopes have a 10X ocular lens. The ocular lens is, is where the eyeball actually sits. You see here WF 10X, whoops, sometimes when I click it, it goes to the next slide. Um, WF 10X 18, so the 10X refers to the magnification. The 18, you won't, um, need for this information. You may need it for another, maybe an assignment or something. But the first number in front of the slash is what you have to pay attention to. Um, the objective lenses also have a number as well. Here's what's referred to as the oil immersion lens. It has a 100X magnification. As you can see here, magnification, what I ask people to do is report the actual magnification of what you're looking through the microscope. So there's two numbers you need. First number is you need the number of the ocular and it's always gonna be 10. So the eyepiece is 10. Then there's your objective. And in our lab, we have four objective lenses. And so the oil required, for um, 100, I just can show you down here, the 100 objective oil lens requires two numbers, the 10X from the ocular, the 100 from the objective lens. And the multiplication of those two numbers is a thousand. When I ask you to look at something through a microscope, I'm gonna ask you to also report the magnification 
magnification is two numbers ocular times objective. So if it's a 4x lens, 10 times 4, 40x. 10x lens, 10 times 10, 100. Okay, somebody. <laughs> um, which number do you use on the oil lens? Do you use the 100 or the 1.2 number to tell me the magnification? Hey, excellent. That's right. And Paul and Amanda both say it's the 100, and that's 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 absolutely correct. Okay, so here's some information about the compound microscope. I'm just moving my chat out of the way. Uh, Finally, okay. Live cells lack sufficient contrast to be studied successfully, it says here. Um, but we do look at live cells sometimes. We do look at algae, we do look at protozoa. We just don't look at um, bacteria or fungi because it's col they're colorless. Uh, Paul's got a question about the 18. I have a slide coming up, Paul. It deals with a different term. I'll show you what it means in, uh, after this. I think it's after this, okay. Um, live cells. So in order to increase the contrast, you need a stain. Staining does introduce artifacts. Um, when I worked in a lab at the university, we had this stain that we would stain all of our samples with, and this stain was very old, um, could have been 15, 20 years old, and we just put the stain on, but because it was old, parts of it had crystallized. So you, when you put the stain on, you'd see these great big, what looked like salt crystals under the microscope. Um, the salt crystals are not bacterial, they're chemical. So there can be what are referred to as artifacts when you look at uh, staining. So staining can cause artifacts. And what staining does is it changes the refractive index of the cell structure. So it makes it denser or um, more visible anyway. Light microscopes are limited by diffraction to 200 nanometers. So you can't um, magnify more than 2000 X. That's the limit of a light microscope. So if it um, goes down to this small size of 200 nanometers or 0.2 micrometers, you can't resolve anything. Um, it just becomes kind of fuzzy at that point. Okay, so here's a picture of the compound microscope. Let me just go through the parts. The it uses visible light. The speed of the visible light is 500 nanometers. Um, there's three glass lenses on this. Uh, one is the ocular lens, another is the objective lens, and a third is a magnifying lens for the light or focusing lens for the light. Ocular, the ocular I said was 10X. Objectives, objective in our lab is on a compound microscope, 4, 10, 40, or 100. And then there's a condenser lens. The condenser lens focuses the light onto your subject. And it's just for moving the light 
to your subject. Um, and there's a lot of different designs for microscopes. And like I was saying, there's the power of the ocular and power of objective. And the res resolution's about 0.2 microns. So if you see something in a microscope at the maximum magnification, you're looking at about 200 nanometers at the finest point. Um, now I have here that second number showing up again here. I thought it would be on this slide. Maybe it's next one. I can't remember what the name of it is right at the moment. Is it the, anyway. Um, so on the microscope, there are two knobs that you would use to focus your object. The outside dial is called the coarse adjustment. And then the inside dial is called the fine adjustment. So you'll see this in the lab tomorrow very clearly. Uh, the course focus is what you always start focusing on. You never use the fine adjustment to start because you'll be there forever. Um, what you really want to do is, let's say this is the objective lens and this is the stage. And my orange cap is the object, um, the microscope slide on the stage. You'll move the stage up towards the lens with the coarse knob. And once the coarse knob gets close enough, it'll be in focus. Now, once it's there, this is why we always start with the 4X lens. Um, once it's at this point, you then swap the lens from the four to the 10 objective and then focus it a little bit more. So you could still course focus at 10 X and then swap the objective lens to the 40 X. At this point, you have, you, your sample is almost touching the lens. You do not want to touch the course lens at this point. You wanna adjust everything with a fine lens. If you use the coarse lens and go too far, you can put your objective lens through the um, slide. Putting an objective lens through a slide is, can be damaging. It can uh, cost up to $600 to replace some of these lenses. So, or, or more, depends on where you go. Um, so stop at the 10X with the coarse focusing only carry on with fine focusing after you get to the 40X lens. So there's always a four-step procedure. One, coarse focus, two, uh, coarse focus, three, 40X is gonna be fine focus. And then what you do is you move the sample aside and put a drop of oil down for the final step of 1000 focus. Questions? Any questions? No? Hmm. I should just give you a second. <laughs> You'll see these things in the lab. <laughs> yeah. We'll have lots of questions when you're actually handling them. The tricky thing that I find everybody getting is that they're having trouble finding where the object is. So always start with the most coarsest objective lens. Always start with the four. And if you move from the four to the 10, you'll probably be successful. There are some problems with our microscope sometimes. Um, a lens is out of whack for some reason and the microscope doesn't want to actually focus fine enough. So someone's kind of over cranked it or under cranked it and 
something's off with the focus. If that's the case, your microscope may be um, something that needs to be repaired. And in that case, I'll just set it aside and try and get the technician, Stacy, to take a look at it. If uh, she's around tomorrow morning, uh, you'll get to meet her. Um, so always start with the four and the 10 lenses for here. Always start from the lowest to the highest magnification. It'll make this lab go fairly easy if you do that. Um, I think I've gone over this, three limitations. You can only image refracting objects effectively. So you need some sort of way to refract things. And that's why we use stain. Then the diffraction limit is 0.2 microns. So we only get 1500X magnification at maximum. That's the best kind of microscope you can buy, um, but we only have 1000 X, but that's okay, they, they work great. And out of focus light from points outside the focal plane can reduce our clarity. Yeah, if you have too much light outside, it can reduce what you see. Paul, I, I don't see the term that I'm looking for. So maybe I didn't include it, we'll have to, we'll see. Um, here's why we use oil with the 100X lens. Outside light can interfere with the visualization of the object, especially if you've really magnified things. And what happens is it turns out that the refractive index of oil matches the refractive index of glass. And because the refractive, excuse me, refractive index of oil is the same, notice here the light, blue light, travels in a straight line through the glass into the lens. Now, if the light happens to not travel through oil, the light bends at a very high refractive index and you won't capture that light on the microscope lens. And because you can't capture that on the lens, you won't even see that thing. So this is why we use oil at 1000 X is to be able to visualize the image. Okay. Um, oh, here's the term. It's the resolving power. Uh, I, I knew it was here someplace. This slide um, is a slide that explains how small a thing you can you resolve with a lens. For example, um, here you see the for this is a math formula. R is the resolution. It's equal to this your your light beam, which is lambda. And that's divided by two times the numerical aperture. Um, when you have a low powered lens, like 4X lens, the numerical aperture is a lot smaller than it is with the higher lens. So you don't see, you don't resolve nearly as well um, with the lower power lens. So recall the speed of light or the lambda is 550 nanometers or uh, 0.55 micrometers. That's my number here. That's where it fits into this formula, 0.55 divided by 
and two numbers multiplied together being two and the numerical aperture, two times 0.1 in the case of a 4X lens. And in the case of a 100X lens, here I took a picture in the lab of a 100X lens and you can see the numerical aperture is 1.25. There's the numerical aperture. So how small a thing can you see in a 4X lens? It's gonna be about 2000 nanometers across. How small a thing can you see with a 100X lens? It's gonna be about 200 nanometers across. So the second number on your microscope objective lens is for the resolving power or the numerical aperture. So there, Paul, sorry. <laughs> I finally found the term for you. Took a while. I, I knew I had it. Uh, here's a ridiculous kind of YouTube video that explains small, uh, small versus far away. Sometimes I watch ridiculous stuff on TV or YouTube. That's just two priests comparing small versus far away. Okay, different kind of microscopy. There's a uh, microscope out there, excuse me, are there? There's, I'm thinking of the two Irish priests, there's a microscope out there, gold, hey, dark field microscopy. Instead of using um, just regular light, they use a minimal quantity of light and they collect that. And what that does is this microscopy improves the contrast. Let me just show you an image. Okay, so the microscopes that we have in lab are called bright field microscopes. So you see here on the right hand side, here's the bright field image. Um, and it is bright. All of this is just like regular light and you'll use a stain, you'll be able to see the color of the stain. That same color of a stain in a dark field microscope, um, which is a different microscope, you can have the same object and you'll notice different effects. And some of these cells here, you'll see there's a line that covers halfway through them. You can't see that line everywhere, but there are some samples that you can see that they do have an actual line through them. You can't see that in a bright field because the contrast isn't good enough, but in a dark field, it enhances the contrast. So you can see little effects like that. And you don't have to do any more preparation than to use a dark field microscope. Um, the problem is, again, resolution isn't great. So in this case, we have potato starch. So in potato starch, you have these little cells of potato starch. And yet, like I said, some of them you can actually make out. Septa that are divided. Um, this may be a good use to show the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell. Maybe you could see a nucleus with the dark field. Um, you may be able to see a nucleus with a yeast cell if it's large enough and you've stained hard enough. It may be a little dot in the center. Okay, next, phase contrast microscope. So phase contrast is a specific kind of microscopy. Um, oh, this is what is used to show up a nucleus in a round cytoplasm. And it was made in the 1930s. This guy, Fritz Zernicki, won the Nobel Prize in 1953 for it. I'm not gonna ask you his name. I just <laughs> provided the information. So let's take a look at a phase contrast microscope. Um, 
So we have here a condenser at the bottom uh, and it's transmitting light through the microscope, which you can see, but there's also a digital camera system. Um, inside of the lens area, there's a phase plate and that phase plate allows you to improve the contrast. There is a problem with this kind of microscopy. If you put a very, you have to have really thin samples, but um, you do get really excellent contrast. So you can see things really, really clearly, which you wouldn't see in a bright field or a dark field microscope, but they get a halo. And that halo can kind of mess up your details. So here's the phase contrast example I've got. Look at the beautiful organelles inside. Like really, you can see lots of stuff in this, but there's also a big bright ring around it, which can kind of mess up the imaging. So it does improve the uh, image, but it also can include halos. So phase contrast is a different type of microscopy. There's also fluorescence microscopy. Um, use a different light bulb for fluorescence microscopy, and you can use the same kind of microscope that we have in the lab. The only difference is uh, if your sample has some sort of fluorescent property, that'll come out. And you can probably think of uh, people buy fluorescent fish now, or they can uh, genetically modify animals to include fluorescence. Um, if you can think that animals can have fluorescence, they can also modify microbes to have fluorescence. And the, they can actually, in a eukaryotic cell, target specific um, organelles with fluorescence. So those organelles will be lit up. So here's an example of a fluorescence microscope that I took image in lab, and I was just lighting up some gram negative rods. The rods here, they have, um, what I was doing was just trying to highlight the length of the rods. So it wasn't anything really complicated. It was just a, a measuring exercise, but the fluorescence can help you irradiate different things. So if you use different uh, molecular probes in a cell, you could shine red fluorescent light, green fluorescent light, or blue fluorescent light through your image, and it would show different things. So um, if you have red fluorescent for, if you can see the netting on this, uh, eukaryotic organism, the netting is showing uh, its structure. Red fluorescent protein was used in that case. Green fluorescent protein was used for the rest of the cell wall. And blue fluorescent protein was used on the what looks like to be the nucleus. So um, if you modify organisms with different fluorescent proteins, you can image things differently. Here's a microscope called, next, <laughs> um, the electron microscope. So Ernst Ruska, Max Knoll, two German inventors again, um, they came up with the idea of using electrons. So what you do is you take a sample. I, I wish I knew what the sample was. Uh, I could look because I've included the link here for the history of the mic electron microscope. You could take a look at this and kind of find out what it is. Um, in this case, what they do is they take their sample and it can be anything. It can be even um, 
a fossil, as long as you make a thin slice of it and put it on somehow onto a slide, and then you have to coat it with a metal. And so one metal that is pretty common is osmium, I believe. It's a heavy, heavy metal. Um, and what they would do is they would cover the object with the metal coating, and then they would bombard it with the electrons. And the electrons would reflect and be detected, and they would read just like a TV screen, and it would come up with these images. Um, gold sputtering is another technique that is used to coat objects with electron microscopy. So here's a little bit of information about, there's the scanning electron microscope for Maxnell and Ernst Ruska. They accelerate electrons, illuminate the surface. And the really cool thing is you can image things up to 100,000 times more than you can with uh, visible light. So you can see things way sharper, way smaller. And here's an example, there I am. I'm sitting next to an electron microscope and taking pictures of some bacteria. Here's a stage, my specimen. Um, electrons are sent through beam, through magnet that is focusing the electrons. And then the electrons are detected on a TV scanner by a detector. And you can see here, using an electron beam, five times 10 to the minus three nanometers, so it's small. Electromagnets, slides, copper grids. And you look at it on a TV screen. Um, you can go from 20x resolution all the way up to 30,000 resolution. I said 100,000. This is not 100,000. This is only uh, 30 times more. It's more anyway. <laughs> okay, so and here's an example of a picture. Um, well, scanning electron microscopes also include a size. So you can see here's a bacterial colony. If this distance from left to right is two millimeters across, then you can actually kind of make out how big parts of the colony are. In this case, the bacteria made comma-shaped colonies. Sebastian writes, cellular photography can be beautiful. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, here's difference between uh, phase contrast micros microscopy and scanning electron microscopy. Oh, sorry, not phase contrast, transmission electron microscopy. So um, in transmission electron microscopy, it's using a similar, another technique, but it's using a thin slice of an, a region. So you can actually see across the bacteria. So if you think of E. coli bacteria as being long rod-shaped bacteria, um, if you take a microplane where you've cut through the bacteria, and in this case, you can set the bacteria against microvilli. That sounds like the apparatus in your intestines. So you can visualize what the E. coli look like against the villi in your intestines. So you have to thinly slice them and stain them with heavy metals. And in this case, the magnification is 10,000 to 100,000 times. So about three times more than the scanning electron microscope at its maximum amount. Uh, 
Um, scanning electron 1,000 times to 10,000 times. Well, it can be smaller. It can be 20 times to 10,000 times. Depends where you look at the uh, source. Um, different places give you different numbers. <laughs> so, but in this case, I've been looking at these uh, rod shaped bacteria at around a thousand time magnification. There is another kind of microscopy. It's called STEM. STEM is the scanning tunneling electron microscopy. Uh, people are still winning prizes for microscopy. This one was won in 1986. Still, um, that's quite a while ago, isn't it? <laughs> it's the strongest kind of microscope because you can actually visualize individual atoms. So um, here's an image, a single cobalt thalocyanine molecule. So you can see that there's the cobalt in the center and the thalocyanine surrounding it. And what that thalocyanine looks like, pretty impressive that they can resolve something that small to one molecule size. There's another kind of microscopy called the atomic force microscope. The atomic force microscope looks at a surface. Um, it's a probe. The probe is on a cantilever and the probe kind of bounces up and down against the shape and that bouncing uh, as it touches the object is registered and by how much, so it kind of tells you how deep the thing is. Let's take a look at a picture. So here's a picture of a couple of food things, lactobacillus rhamnosus. It's a milk bacteria or a yeast bacteria or a cheese bacteria. Same thing with lactococcus lactis, lactobacillus planetarum, bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, Aspergillus fumigatus is a yeast, or it's sort of not a yeast, it's a, it's a mold. Um, Corneobacterium glutamisum. So there's a bunch of different kind of organisms. And this gives you an idea what the surface of these microbes look like. So they don't have the similar smooth surfaces. Some are rough, some are striated. This one, letter D, has Bacillus thuringiensis. You can see it's got a really Amazing. Do you remember what these elongated parts are called? Yeah, thanks. Uh, Amanda's got flagella, yeah, uh, 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 as the answer, and that's correct. The um, Bacillus thuringiensis have long flagella. Um, letter E, the Aspergillus fumigatus have these long canidia for um, that are being imaged with the atomic force microscopy. So there's lots of detail you can see here. And what are the size ranges? Well, we saw seen some from what was the form of E? Oh, sorry. Um, this is E is a mold or fun, uh, yeah, fungus, and it's an aspergillus fungus. We'll learn more about aspergillus fungus in a later class, but this um, it's like the sporulating portion of its body. Uh, Canidia four, uh, Canidia, so it, it's forming this long shaft and the shaft have a fruiting body that sprouts out 
uh, the spores. And these spores are what get ejected into the air. Um, and this is why if you take a, a Petri dish and to set it down, can, there's so much Canidia 4 in the air from various kinds of mold and yeasts, molds um, that, not yeasts, that just kind of land on the plate in 20, 15 to 20 minutes, your plate will have contamination. So um, anyway, that's aspergillus. <laughs> Thanks, William. Good question. It's just part of the stock of the fungus. Okay, so here's kind of a metric numeration going from what do we see at 1,000? You see atoms, 10 nanometer, uh, sorry, one nanometer is molecules. 10 nanometers, you'll see things like proteins or DNA. 100 nanometers, you'll see um, the proteins and the DNA forming shapes, what are referred to as subunits. And then at one micrometer, you have organelles forming or visualizing. At one micrometer, you can also see that's a eukaryote. Um, in bacteria, you can see as small as one micrometer. In cells, you can see one to two micrometers in size. 10 micrometers is a good sized cell. Um, that's a fairly large cell that's typically a eukaryotic cell. So this is more of a eukaryotic kind of, ah, see it says eukaryotic cells 10 to 100 micrometers. And then most bacteria in this range between 10 and one micrometer. It's a very hard slide to read. I should fix this. Note to self. Okay. So the power of the microscope, the yellow uh, area here is your light microscope, the orange area being the scanning microscope. That's a, just a different kind of microscope that you can use. Oh, it's even got a range here for the electron microscope going all the way up to 100 micrometers. That's correct. <laughs> Okay, questions. Okay, finally. Uh, but yeah, I didn't get through the food bacteria. Identify maximum res. I'm going to skip these questions and just go through what are the four steps to see microbes at the highest magnification? Four steps 4x, 10x, uh, 40x, then 100x. How do you know if you've made a successful microscope slide, things aren't moving on the slide? And you can make out the border of the cells. Also, if you make a successful slide, you can make out individual cells. It's not too crowded. That's another thing. Calculate the magnification using a 10x ocular lens. I'll leave that as an exercise to you. Oh. Anybody? Thanks, Paul, Amanda, <laughs> everybody's got the answer. Thank you. Okay, um, here's another one, 10 times 40. They're fairly simple. You can see them. Thanks, Sebastian, Danielle. Excellent. Okay, I don't know if I'll get through very much of the food bacteria section. So I should end this in about a minute or two. Um, but I do want to cover this. So like I said at the beginning of class, we will meet again as a class next week, Monday on campus. And so I'll have, I'll share this information on campus. Um, we learned about Fanny Hess. Fanny Hess took agar and made uh, the contribution of agar to grow bacteria. Before that, you would grow bacteria on potatoes. This is Robert Koch's contribution to growth of 
microbes. He could grow Bacillus anthracis on potatoes. Fanny Hess managed to grow all kinds of other um, microbes on agar. And here's a field of women, looks like women, working on an agar plantation where they harvest the agar from the sea. And that's going to be refined and used in our lab as uh, agar for our petri dishes. And I talk a little bit about petri and Hans Graham. Um, here's a picture of a food called nata, natto. It's a Japanese soybean fermented food made, in, made with Bacillus subtilis. And I wanted you to see a name of a bacteria by the end of class. Here's Bacillus subtilis. Um, there's a specific way to write it. If it's written, it's typically italicized, or if it's handwritten, it's underlined. And there's lots of lactobacilluses out there. So if you're doing the assignment, you could look at one of these. Here's a Liberté Kefir, and I found a website or a new scientific paper that uh, wrote out names of different lactobacillus that are in kefir. And also uh, Streptococcus is another important gram-positive organism. And then there's gram-negative called Acetobacter. Acetobacter is really important for vinegar, but I'm not going to have time to cover everything. And I know you have to go leave guys. So huh, thanks for listening to me. Um, and I'll cover the bacteria bits in class again next week, Monday. I didn't have enough time to really do a good job on it. So we'll have to cover that next week. And that's me saying thanks for listening. Thanks to Paul, Brooklyn, Israel, Robert, Case, Shuba for answering questions. I appreciate that. I'll see you guys in the lab tomorrow, 8 a.m. for group one, uh, 10 a.m. for group two. Good luck. Thanks for listening. And I'll stay online in case some of you have a question. I'm okay with that. Uh, when was the first assignment due? I have a date of the first Monday in February. So not next week, January 31st, but the week after. So have a good night, Amanda, Cassie, Matthew. Thanks for listening. See you guys tomorrow. Cassie, I see you're still online. Did you have a question? Okay, no questions, <clears throat> I take it so. Um,
Thanks for listening. Have a good night. Uh, see you tomorrow in lab. I'm going to end the lecture now. Talk to you later. Bye.